Welcome to episode 382 of We Don't Die Radio. I'm your host, Sandra Champlain, author of the international best-selling book called We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. And this is another video episode. So if you are listening today on your favorite podcast and you'd rather be watching, just go to YouTube and type in the search We Don't Die Radio 382. And there's an interesting story of how I met our guest today. There's an upcoming conference with our friends at IANS, which is the International Association for Near Death Studies. It's going to be held in person and online August 31st through September 4th, 2000, or 2022, I'll say that. Um, and it's on life after death, the near death experiences, and our favorite subjects all related to that. And I was asked to be a speaker. I'm not able to attend live, but I am going to upload a video presentation. So I got a lovely email from a lovely gentleman named Darren, who is going to be the in-between for this. And on one of the emails, I just happened to click on his website, which is seekingi.com, seeking-i, as in i.com. And he's a like-minded soul. He most definitely is. He had a fear of dying at a very young age, and he's got one of those skeptical and scientific minds that we love so much. And he's done his own investigations, and now he has his own YouTube channel and his own podcast called Seeking Eye, and has 64 episodes as we are recording this today. So I want him to tell you in his own words. So Darren McKennedy, welcome to We Don't Die Radio. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Well done. You got the name correct. Not many people do. Well, um, yeah, it's just a new one. And I know people mispronounce my, my name all the time. So it's okay. Mm. Got me sound Cham like Champlain. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, so you don't know many Champlains. I don't think there are too many of us. Anyways. No. Well, it's Less, lovely to meet you. Yeah. And you, and you, thanks for having me on. Yeah, yeah. that's kind of a bolt out of the blue, your email inviting me on. I do, of course, know that we don't die radio specifically. I've seen it around and uh, it's uh, very much a privilege to uh, be asked to come on. Oh, I see you, uh, you, you read my, did you um, see the uh, the bio on the website? Or is, yeah. oh, no, that's, that's the new website, isn't it? You wouldn't have seen mm -hmm. that yet. So uh, I appreciate you having a look at the videos. Yeah, well, it's really nice to meet like-minded people and anyone when I ever hear like scientific mind and you know looking for evidence and all that kind of stuff I mean that's that's my background as well and it all started with a fear of dying mm. so with that you know your story better than anyone we have all the time in the world so if you kind of want to take us back to um yeah where where it all began for you and let us know where you're located as well well, I'm in the UK, as most people probably can tell from the accent. Everyone thinks I sound posh. I'm not whatsoever. Um, I come from a place called Essex, which uh, most people will know it from The Only Way is Essex, which is a show over here, uh, which is very unrealistic to most of us. Um, but I'm now in, in kind of the Cambridge area around there. Well-known city, but I'm a little bit out of that. Um, but yeah, I mean, it all began. Um, I was bullied quite severely in, in primary school or what you'd call elementary school um and I was always quite sensitive but that kind of sparked I believe I'm not sure but I believe that the bullying kind of sparked the whole series of events um it affected me so badly I ended up with shingles at 10 years old because uh, it absolutely wrecked my immune system the stress of it um and that kind of started bringing the whole anxiety situation up slightly you could tell something was wrong um and that was when I was 10 and then when I was 12 in what we call secondary school what you would call um, I suppose middle school probably um, I experienced a traumatic event which was not many people would consider it traumatic but for me being so sensitive I fainted in a science lesson because I didn't realize I was squeamish and then we did something in biology about the circulatory system the teacher said something and bang I was out um, went down hit my head uh, woke up with everybody staring around me and some of them giggling and then that wasn't very nice and that really kind of was the spark to the ignition that, that started the whole anxiety disorder i was always very nervous and very quiet as i said but the disorder actually began with that trigger um over time it, it mainly focused on health anxiety and it still does which means you know a stomach ache would be in my mind 
a stomach tumor or something very, very serious, um, which made me feel even worse. And if everyone knows what anxiety does, it, it's a huge spiral that makes you feel like you're dying. And I did. I felt like I was dying every day of my life. Um, again, not just being afraid of dying, but feeling physically like I was dying. It was it was horrible. I couldn't get out of bed a lot of the time. I certainly didn't want to. Um, when I was 16, I experienced a emotional breakdown and the depression kind of began well it began before that I suppose it naturally came off of the anxiety there the two are often related but at 16 I had a, a big a big down spiral of it and I became suicidal um, because feeling like I was dying every day I didn't want to live like that for the next 70 80 years and I thought well what other choice do I have you know I can either take my own life which I, I knew I couldn't do because of the fear of death the fear of never existing again and at this point that's what I believed um, you know, I was always very scientifically minded, even back then. And I thought it's clear brain creates consciousness. Once you die, that's it. Why would it be anything else? So I, I knew I wouldn't have taken my own life because I didn't want to have that experience or that non-experience. It terrified me. So I just kind of had to suffer through it. And eventually it kind of resolved itself on the up, uptick. I tried going to various um counselors and, and psychotherapists they did very little to help me uh, a little bit here and there but ultimately it was not particularly helpful um, i forced myself back into school for the last two years at 17 and 18 um during the time i was at school i was in the, the learning support area which was in a in a big building it was in the the dungeon area of the building we were taken away completely forgotten about not, not supported really at all my grades went from a's down to d's um, got back in for the last two years and managed to come out with A pluses at the end of it and, and Bs at the, at the lowest. So I managed to do that pretty much on my own with the support of mum and dad, but nobody else, unfortunately. Um, and since then, it's just been kind of a roller coaster up and down of the depression and the anxiety. It's just the way it goes. It's on a cycle. But nowadays, having been at the lowest of the low, you can begin to recognize the illusion behind the depression and it doesn't affect you quite so badly. Now, I won't pretend I don't get suicidal now and then or suicidal tendencies now and then I do. But nowadays I can recognize them and not let them affect me too much. Um, and that will, of, of course, I hope get better the more times it happens. Experience is the big teacher. Um, but during that time, when I was low with the anxiety and the depression, that's when I really began looking at subjects relating to death because I was so terrified of it that I thought if there's any chance whatsoever that there's something more to it, it's worth knowing about because I'd heard about near death experiences was the first thing I believe I heard about because that was what was popular at the time. Um, and it was all the, you know, the, the fluffy clouds going through the tunnel and seeing the deceased relatives. And, and I, I was thinking, you know, it's, it's, clearly all just in the brain it must be because you know when you die your your brain is dying you can release chemicals your electric electrical activity will be all over the place you can't take stories of dying brain seriously you know because they're in such a state but when i started looking into it the distinct similarities were interesting but again i thought everybody has the same kind of brain you'd expect that to be the case and then i came across veridical perception and i thought hang on this shouldn't happen because it shouldn't be that when your brain is in a state where maybe subjectively you could, cre you could create all these erratic hallucinogenic kind of chemicals and, and all these weird situations, but you shouldn't be able to hear things that are going on in another room and see things that are going on in another city and then come back and report it and have it corroborated by your doctors who are around. And you especially shouldn't be able to do that when your brain is flat or flat lined on the EEG. Right. Um, you shouldn't be aware, let alone be able to see things that you shouldn't be able to see. You shouldn't be able to know about people who have died, who you didn't know were dead at the time and nobody knew were dead at the time. You shouldn't be able to have contact with deceased people who tell you about something hidden somewhere that nobody knew about and then go back and find it. That shouldn't happen with brain chemicals and electrical activity. So I started looking more into veridical perception just online. Um, I'd ask things in chat rooms for you know links to, to things and i usually got responses saying you know it's all nonsense it's all just you know faulty memory and things like that um but as i started looking a bit more into it i started finding other phenomena uh, phenomena such as terminal lucidity and out of body perception and things like that where um the evidence 
if we were to take it that these generally happened, which I had no reason to doubt, um, if these generally happened, they all kind of pointed to one direction, which was that there's something more to consciousness than we currently understand. Um, I mean, you take into context the, the complexity of the universe and the amount that we understand versus we don't understand, it seems stupid to assume that we know any, anything about us, our own brain, our own consciousness and how it works. But back then, you know, you, you believe what you're taught, you believe what is in the popular culture and the popular scientific understanding, which is reasonable. Um, but when you start diving into phenomenal activity or phenomenal experiences, you begin to think this shouldn't happen under, under this model. So maybe there's something more. Um, in 2018, I started the Seeking Eye project, which was um, effectively, it was just a way of, but well, it started off connecting people um, together to talk about these things. I'd hire out the local village halls and the local kind of um, recreation centers around um, to get people in to just talk about these things. And nobody ever showed up for any of them. <laughs> so in the end, I decided I'll take this online. I started a little blog and started writing about some of the, <clears throat> some of the research I did wasn't particularly not many people were interested so I thought well let's try YouTube then so I started a YouTube channel where I talk about some of these things and and try and get hold of people to interview um the first person I interviewed was somebody who I'd actually gone to one of the groups locally not my own but one of them locally who were talking about Reiki and I found a woman called Christina who was um or Christine who was hosting the, the group and I thought I wonder you know I don't know what Reiki is. I've never heard of it. So let's see if she'll be interested in, in coming on and asking about it. And I might as well record it in the meantime. Uh, so that was the first interview I did with Christine. And then I thought, well, this is good. People responded well to it. So do I dare reach out to some more people who are more well-known, maybe who've written books on near-death experiences and other phenomena? So I reached out to Peter Panagor. Um, and he, he got back to me. And I, that was surprising. But we talked about his near-death experience. He was the first kind of near-death interview I did. And then after I got the confidence of having someone actually respond, who was well-known, I thought, I'll just shoot out emails left and right and see what happens. And most of them came back very, you know, glad to, to come on for free, which surprised me because I was under the impression that, you know, most people who are writing about near-death experiences are, are doing it for the money because they're writing books, they're getting into the popular culture. It surprised me that they were so willing to come on. And after talking to these people, you realize that's definitely not the case. You know, that, that's not why they're doing it at all. Um, and then from then I've just been, I started the podcast. I've started a various series of videos under different subjects and different layouts. And as you say, so far, 64 episodes of the podcast, um, various other videos of other other areas of research and it's all i share it all for free as far as i can um, online you know i only ever charge for things when i have to pay for someone to come on or i have to pay for website uh, um, online tools or hosting and things like that zoom or whatever but as much as i can you know it's all completely free i don't think i've ever charged as of yet which i think is important because the more this information gets out um the more growth it can it can sustain in the scientific community so that's yeah. really kind of up to now where i am wow is what i can <laughs> say oh my goodness and yeah that's kind of how i got my start too in my show we don't die radio is free also no commercials just talk and i found when i researched so many people who have had near-death experiences one of the main themes they come back with is being of service and so I haven't met anybody who wanted me to pay them for anything. Even some of the biggest people like Evan Alexander and others, mm -hmm. um, it took a while before he had the time, but you know, once he did, it's just another opportunity to share and make a difference. So I will, and those of you who are watching right now, you'll see in the description, a link to Darren's podcast and the youtube channel so go subscribe if you like me in this currently, conversation um, like currently it. on currently on 999 subscribers today so that will be interesting almost so we'll hitting see. that first four figures <laughs> let's do it let's do it together and you mentioned um i don't remember the term you said for those experiences that can't be the brain shutting down what's the veridical term you perception call it? yes veridical perception mm. yeah term wow. by jan holden Yes, it was a great term. And I love Jan. 
there was, I think two or three months ago, a report that came out from a group of scientists that said that near-death experience cannot be the brain shutting down. Now they didn't say it's definitely life after death, but they said it couldn't be that because of all yeah. those things that you mentioned. Well, I mean, it, it could be the brain shutting down. However, that would entail that there's a nature of the brain that's probably would have to be paranormal anyway. So exactly, you know, I mean, if it is the brain shutting down, I would suggest it's more likely that the brain is is limiting the experience. So when it's shutting down, it's allowing for more natural experience to come through and more natural abilities to come through, which would be argued by the psychedelic effects as well that lowers brain activity. Yes, yes. Could you give us some of those stories? Because you gave me goosebumps when you were talking about that world um, of things that we shouldn't be able to know from either from your interviews or uh people that see things that they shouldn't see or know things that mm. they shouldn't know you have any of those so, stories the most famous generally um that people will probably know is pam reynolds do you know of pam reynolds so pam reynolds experienced an aneurysm in her brain a big aneurysm i believe i'm probably going to be getting some of these things wrong because it's not really a, a, a one i've delved deeply into but i have discussed it quite a bit so i know the basics and effectively she had to undergo she was a a music artist a musical artist you know a musician and she had to undergo a full body yeah you know, it was called hypothermic um, cardiac arrest so her body had to be lowered in temperature to around i can't remember the exact but it was in the 20 degrees celsius so they could drain all the blood out of her body so they could work on this aneurysm without worrying about it causing you know permanent damage so they had to cool the body down, drain all the blood, stop the heart, of course, with no blood, well, very little blood in there. There's the heart working would have just been problematic. So they did that, and they put her under a state called birth suppression, which is effectively the brain is flatlined, and that doesn't mean the brain isn't, isn't really working. It means the cortical activity, the, the main part of the brain that is believed to make us human, is effectively not working at all and all that's left is the brain stem which is the um regulates you know breathing heart rate reflex um experiences things like that you know um survival instincts and under birth suppression what they did is they put two molded earphones one in each ear and played in one really fast continuous clicks and in the other white noise each at 100 decibels which is the same as standing next to someone with a jackhammer um, in each year. And why they did that is because as the brain was shut down to the level of the brainstem to make sure she was still functioning to some degree, they would monitor the brainstem's reflexes to these sounds to make sure she was still okay. But burst suppression is effectively far, 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 far lower a level of consciousness than um, general anesthesia. So she wasn't aware you know, during this state. And she, well, while in that state, she came out of her body now, most people contest that, or most people report that this was while her heart was stopped. It wasn't. Her heart wasn't stopped at this time, but she was under birth suppression, which means if she was conscious, it would have been one in a billion trillion, you know, chance that she could have been conscious at that state. Um, and she certainly shouldn't have been, is what the um, Dr. Spetzler, who was the head surgeon, reported. Um, and she reported coming out of her body and, of course, looking around and seeing what was going on. And she, accurately reported three things she reported the um bone saw that was being used to open her skull she reported as a it was like an electric toothbrush kind of thing and it, it was it was a long thin electric toothbrush with a with a saw blade on the top of it effectively and i believe she got the um the model of it correct i might be making that up but i'm sure i've read something she did regardless she was able to describe the, the details of what it looked like some argue that she, if she was still conscious somehow, or she was recording input, she could have kind of got the sound of the bzzz on the on the bone, and felt it, and, and assumed, well, it must be kind of this, like a like a dental drill sort of thing, possibly, ignoring the fact she was under birth suppression at the time. Uh, the second thing she reported was the doctor saying that the artery in her left or right, I think it was left leg, was too small to get the was it the catheter in. I can't remember. Um, so that was the second thing that she got correct. And that was certainly while she was, her body was lowered to the temperature and she was under birth suppression. And a third thing that she reported was hearing hotel California playing in the, um, 
in the operating theatre at the time. Now, Gerald Verley, who's a anesthesiologist, a very good anesthesiologist, who's been um, looking for the, the more sceptical argument against the Pam Reynolds case, has argued that, because the main thing you would question is, okay, so she heard Hotel California, that was definitely correct, that was playing. And she definitely heard the doctors talking about her leg. That was that was definitely the case. And she was definitely under birth suppression at that time, according to the um, the general procedure of, of hypothermic cardiac arrest that was used. How would she have heard that? Assuming she was in her body at the time, which means the sounds would have come to her ears. She reported hearing these. She never reported hearing any clicks or any, you know, any white noise playing at 100 decibels in each ear. Now, Gerald Verley argues that he did a test where you could put these in your ear, playing 100 decibels. I'm guessing these were normal headphones, not molded surgical earphones. But he put them in his ears and he said, I could hear what was going on around me faintly, but I could hear it and I could discern what was being said. Fair enough. However, he wasn't under um, birth suppression, first of all, where the, flat, the, the EEG was flat. Um, second of all, Pam reported hearing these, but didn't, as I say, didn't report hearing the clicks. Now, if, if you had these in your ears and you were somehow hearing through these clicks, you wouldn't not hear the clicks. You, you'd hear them kind of very faintly over the clicks. She said, I didn't hear any, any sounds other than what was, being, what was being said. Now, to me, the only really logical way I can, I can explain this is that she was somehow perceiving sound outside of her body without the use of her ears, which were having the clicks and the white noise. A hundred, bear in mind, a hundred decibels is pretty loud. So we don't know, of course, how it's possible that she was receiving audible um, stimuli without ears, but that's kind of the only way I can fathom that it could have possibly happened. So that's, that's the Pam Reynolds case, and that's a very well-known one. Um, which is why I, I kind of went into more detail about it because it's often kind of misquoted some parts of it. Uh, another less well-known case and a much quicker case is one that Jan Holden told me about. Um, and again, the details kind of elude me, but generally the general idea was someone who was, I believe, under cardiac arrest or under very deep anesthesia came out of their body during an operation and wandered non-physically um, through the hospital, through the walls, didn't have to use doors, through the walls into another operating theatre where she or he saw some doctors with an amputated leg and they put this amputated leg in a yellow bag, disposable yellow or a yellow disposal bag, and put that aside somewhere. Um, they came back and described exactly you know, word for word what they saw and it was completely accurate it was verified um, that you know the bag was yellow it was this leg that they saw and it was happening kind of a few at the same time as the operation it was happening a few wards down she explained you know she described exactly where it was um, what happened well all while being and I can't remember if it was under very deep general anesthesia or whether it was during cardiac arrest I believe it was anesthesia but I'm not 100% sure um, I'm sure that the case is written up somewhere I'm not sure where, because I say Jan told me about it. Um, I've spoken to a few people about that subject or about that particular case on my channel, a skeptic. I asked him what he thought about that case, because that was interesting. And the explanation he came up with was that it would be reasonable to assume that someone who was passing the ward at the time was talking about what they'd done and how they'd done it, because it's in a hospital setting. Um, fair enough, I don't no, I mean, we, we can't validate whether that happened or not because we weren't there. Um, you could reasonably assume that. However, if this is more, you know, kind of a, uh, I mean, if, if the procedure is, is as clear as it is for amputated limbs, you can imagine it's happened quite a few times. So would it be you know, conversation worthy between nurses walking past other wards and they'd have to walk past that particular ward at that particular time? It, it, it's, I don't know. I mean, we can speculate, but we weren't there. So there are, in several cases like that that do have explanations in the physical sense but to me a lot of them are, are a stretch especially when taking evidence from other phenomena like veridical like um evidential mediumship and 
uh, remote viewing and past life memories, all that point to the to consciousness not necessarily being created by the brain, that I think it's much more parsimonious to assume that there's something about consciousness we don't know, um, which to me seems ridiculous to think that we know everything about it. It's funny. Have you seen any of the on television, the new pictures coming out from the web camera mm -hmm. that's out in outer space? Mm -hmm. It's um, 100 miles, 150 thousand or million kilometers out there in outer space taking pictures of this never-ending universe and it's mm. capturing pictures from around the time of the big bang right mm. billions of years old things that we will never be able to investigate or even comprehend in mm. our i don't want to say all of ours but the sandra before i got interested in this very opinionated i knew it all but it's like we don't <laughs> <laughs> I think what what, the, what in the universe we can understand constitutes, and I'll get so many different figures, and uh, every time I've looked at this, it's every website has a different figure, and every conversation has a different figure. It's something like 5% of the universe we understand. It's, it's very from like 0.05% to something like 20% in between there. Even so, you know, so that would mean at the max, 80% of the universe is un, undiscover, undiscovered, the nature of it. And, you know, there's just more phenomena coming out and more things being discovered every day that you have to question based on correlations, which is consciousness and the brain correlated. Um, you have an experience where you see that this lights up in the brain. Based on correlations alone, we can't discern a causational relationship. And we have more and more experiences coming out that just seem to, to say that this correlation may not be a causal one, you know. Um, but for some reason in the Western society, it is taken as a, as a, as a, or a previously understood um, truth that the brain creates consciousness based on correlation, um, which it may be, but we can't, I don't think, reasonably conclude that now with these experiences that are coming out, especially the veridical perception, um, peak in Darien experiences, which you know about peak in Darien experiences. I don't. It's when I briefly mentioned it earlier, it's where somebody, um, receives information about someone who has died maybe they, they're in a near-death experience and they see someone um, who's died and they don't know nobody knows that they were dead at the time right. and they come back and then maybe the next day or even i'll tell you about one case that jan i think it was jan again told me about someone came out of their body during um, a near-death experience saw i think it was their sister who was maybe or she was at university at the time so she was very young and she you know asked her the person that was having the near-death experience and i hope i'm not conflating kind of mixing two cases up i might be but the point remains um, yeah yeah she, she came to the near-death experiencer who was her brother or sister and said you know tell mum i'm sorry about the the red car or about her car um so they came back and she said or he said i saw evelyn you know while i was out of body um so she said you know i'm sorry about the car and of course they thought oh, well, doesn't really make much difference because you know Evelyn's at university so I don't know why you saw her um I think it was the same day a few hours later or maybe a few minutes later even they got a call from the police saying Evelyn's been in a car crash and she's I'm sorry you know she's gone she's she's passed and that was as I say you know pretty much exactly the same time this person had the out-of-body experience and, and saw her is when it took place and of course you know she said tell mom I'm sorry about the car um i've wrecked it or something like that and of course you know she died in in the car crash and that's that's an example of something that is often seen as anecdotal but i would consider more a case study because it is third party verified by the you know the, the parents the doctors who were there at the time to witness the call and the report from the near-death experience so that sort of thing that's a peak in dairy and experience I've not heard that expression, but I know what it is you're talking about. Mm. I've spoken to uh, plenty of people who've had near-death experiences that did not know that someone died, but mm. the, yet they saw them. And then also there's so much research on um, with hospice and people just before they pass away, you know, someone's there to greet them or take them mm. home. And so many times they're loved ones that they didn't know had passed because family yeah. members you know the people are already on their deathbed last thing they're going to say is hey your brother died you know something like that but they're right there to greet them and uh, mm. that's fascinating it is there are also cases of people who see um 
brothers and sisters who they never knew they had. And later it turns out, you know, when they tell their, their parents or their, their mothers specifically, you know, their mothers will say, you know, I had, um, you know, you were a twin of two and the other one was stillborn. And I never told you because I didn't want that on you. But, you know, and things like that, just little things like that, that you, you, that you question. And it's difficult to really verify all of the stories because a lot of them are subjective and there's no way of really validating that they took place. But there's enough that have been validated to no longer really need to doubt the authenticity of some of these experiences. Yes. And not everyone who's had a near-death experience has a book or is out in mm -hmm. the public. I was just speaking the other day when you look at a YouTube video and you look at some of the comments and whether it's um, somebody speaking just moments before they pass and seeing someone or a near-death experience, there's a little secret. If you go into some of the comments, the viewers write in their own experience mm -hmm. many of the times. Mm -hmm. And there are so many just from regular people and they have the most beautiful things that they witnessed their dogs and cats were there to greet them their parents or grandparents looking in their 30s mm -hmm. and they are as vivid and real and then when they do come back they are more clear than any memory mm. they've had even if they had it when they were three years old it is mm. vivid and it's it's certainly you know a species-wide phenomena irregardless of your your background your belief your color your gender um your um upbringing you know your the amount of money you have it doesn't matter which a lot of people seem to try to fit near-death experiences into a particular religion especially when they use them as arguments however i see it more as a scientific question than a religious one because it is so widespread amongst the entire human species that it's clearly a part of nature, of our nature, ir you know, irrespective of beliefs or mindset that has as of yet been discovered. And it's, in my opinion, a scientific question to discover that. However, the science that we currently have, the, the methods that we currently have, which focus on the material nature of, of, of um, existence, which is important, but I think it's missing that aspect that will inevitably answer the questions that, that we have. Um, especially it won't until it starts acknowledging that these experiences do happen and are as of yet inexplicable. Yeah. And see, um, seeking eye, Darren, it's not just near-death experiences. You talk to all kinds of people. Do you want to kind of talk about some of the different topics so, or people that you're looking? Mm -hmm. So seeking eye, eye. Um, a lot of people introduce me as a near-death researcher. I'm not. Uh, it's just that so many people, you know, near-death experiences are the most popular um, phenomena out there and to, to many people, the most evidential. And so when I talk to people or get requests for people to come on my show, it's usually about near-death experiences. But no, uh, my main area of focus is the possibilities of life after death, which came about because of my fear of death. Um, near-death experiences are a big part of that, especially uh, with my work with IANS, who are, of course, the, near -death, the International Association of Near-Death Studies. But I've spoken to several people and I mentioned the first interview I did was actually on Reiki, which is <laughs> energy healing, allegedly. Um, something I never believed in. I went, I went to the lady to have a session because I just thought, oh, I'm interested in it, let's try it. And she offered it for free, which is very nice. But so I went and I must say, you know, the heat that came out of her hands were unbelievable. It's very unnatural amount of heat. Unless she had like hidden hair dryers or something on her hands and she was that was a lot of heat. And I thought that was interesting. Didn't really do much for my mental situation or my physical situation at the time. Not that there was much wrong with me, but I didn't know it's much of a difference, but that heat was enough to make me think something's going on here. That's not particularly natural, if you know what I mean. Um, so she was the first interview I did. Uh, and then from there, the other subjects I focus on is pretty much anything related to the nature of consciousness and possibilities of life after death so mediumship um, i've spoken to suzanne geesman who's a well-known medium um someone who i went to for a mediumship reading who was very very good called maria or marie who's uh, not far up the road from me actually um who else on mediumship there was a few others but also um out of body experiences that is willful out of body experiences or astral projection some people call it um, I've spoken to a few practitioners on that because that can include veridical perception as well without the near-death situation. 
um, psi phenomena. I've spoken to Stanley, Dr. Stanley Krippner, among others, for um, remote viewing and uh, telepathy and things like that, and the research done for that. Uh, what else? Terminal lucidity or paradoxical lucidity. Uh, Michael Nam, you know about paradoxical lucidity? I'll go back to that in a minute. No. Um, and then, if you remind me, I'll forget. Uh, and then past life memories with Dr. Jim Matlock. Uh, mem past life memories in children, very interesting and very strong evidence if you consider it more than anecdotes, which they are, but most people yeah, ignore that. <laughs> um, uh, pet experiences, experience, um, uh, meetings with pets and communication with pets. That was Karen Anderson who wrote the book. Yes, that's was her, uh, yeah. The Amazing Afterlife of Pets or something like that it's called. I can't remember. It was a long time ago. But me and mum actually co-hosted that one because that was not long after we lost um, Ty and Omi, my two little schnauzers. We lost them. But they were two years apart in age, but we lost them both on the same day from two different things. Oh. And that, that was cross. I've never known grief like that before. And people will say, I mean, you know, I, I was posting on Facebook about, you know, the, the feelings I was having. I'm always very open and I find it helpful to talk to people about things, um, which not enough people do for depression, unfortunately. And I was, I was talking to him about, you know, how much I miss them. And, and I was getting comments like, well, just be grateful, you know, you didn't lose a child, you know, or something like that. But to me, love is love. You know, there's, there's no difference between whether you lose a child or a pet if the love is the same. Absolutely. The and, more we um, love, the more it hurts, unfortunately. Exactly. So there's that as well. Um, pet communications, not something I know a lot about and not really something we can validate. So I don't really particularly look at that that much on for seeking eye, but more as a personal thing. I, I look at that quite a bit. And I'm sure I've missed some phenomena that I've looked at um, and spoken about. I suppose other philosophies of mind as well, idealism, panpsychism, physicalism, illusionism, which don't make sense to me, and things like that. Just ev everything around that kind of subject of consciousness and the possibility of life after physical death. Yeah, I took a look at your episodes, and we only have a few guests in common. So if you're interested, check out Seeking Eye podcast. So <laughs> I had to remind you about paradoxical lucidity. Paradoxical lucidity, right. It was originally called terminal lucidity it's been recently renamed i think or generally looked at more as paradoxical lucidity because it is paradoxical you'll know about it but you probably just haven't heard the term so during brain degenerative diseases like alzheimer's or um, dementia it's often the case or not often the case it's quite rare but it, it does occur more often than it should <laughs> that sometimes months but more commonly days or hours before someone passes through these diseases um, and you know with Alzheimer's and, and uh, dementia that people will experience complete memory loss they, they won't know who's talking to them they don't know where they are who they are and that's usually the case up until they die and it's it's a horrible thing to to go through more so as the loved one than the person because going to see your mother and them not knowing who you are is not a very nice thing but it's sometimes happens and as I say more often than it should that hours, days, or months at the longest before they die, often minutes or hours, suddenly lucidity, full lucidity will return inexplicably for no reason. Um, and people will recognize who they're talking to. They'll know where they are. They have a nice conversation about the past and, and you know, the, the possible futures of their children or whatever else before they pass away. And Anatomically speaking, it's completely unknown how that can possibly take place from a physical point of view, because these diseases literally eat the brain away. Right. The neuronal connections get lost. And of course, we associate memory with, with neuronal connections. And of course, once those connections are broken, that memory is gone. So how that can possibly take place physically is completely unknown. There's hypotheses around it, but we can't really, they are, to me, very reaching. Um, again, Dr. Gerald Verley, when I mentioned it to him, talks about pH levels causing these sort of things. And I, I don't know enough about that. I'm not an anesthesiologist or anything, but it's still very much of a stretch considering what we believe memory to be. Um, and of course, others hypothesize that it's the disconnection from the limiting um, effects of the physical brain as consciousness separates from it um, impending death, which it could be. We don't know. And again, it comes down to what is the correlation between mind and brain, which 
ultimately you come across the hard problem of consciousness, which is a whole other subject. How can non-physical matter create consciousness, which most people assume, but never really think much about how difficult that would be to, to evidence. So terminal lucidity is a very strong evidence to me that the mind is not necessarily created, at least in full, by the physical brain, because otherwise that should not happen by everything we understand about neurology. Absolutely. I agree with you. Now, I know when I wake up every morning, I typically forget that I'm the Sander Champlain that's researched all this afterlife thing. And I think it's a by design of our human nature that we play the game of being a human and experience the highs and lows, et cetera, and so forth. Doing this show, talking to great guests like yourself, keeps me exactly where I need to be, open to all possibilities. I know you've had a background of depression and still battling it. How does it make a difference to you when you interview someone or you find something new to investigate? It depends on the current state of my depression. If I'm in a low, um, it may kind of boost me up a little bit, but then not for very long and I'll start to doubt again. Um, but again, uh, you know, I've had these lows so many times now that I can recognize it as an illusion, a temporary illusion that will work itself out once the swing low has come back up. But generally talking to people about near-death experiences when I'm kind of at a stable level as I am now, it just offers you that hope that there is a reason for being here. And it's, it's often argued, and it's something I can't understand, that it's the finality of life that gives it its meaning, because we're only here for a short amount of time, um, and that adds the meaning. To me, I, I can see why people believe that, but I, I can only imagine it's because they haven't really thought deeply about what that implies. Because if we're here once and then gone forever, it doesn't matter if you're Mother Teresa or Hitler, right. because ultimately, if material is all there is and it follows the natural laws as we know them, in a few billion, probably longer years, the universe itself and every piece of matter within it will no longer exist. All life that's ever existed will no longer exist forever. So... What's the meaning there? So, you, you know, you, you say, well, the meaning is to make life better for the next generation. Fine, fine, but they're going to die as well. And then everything they do for every other generation, they're also going to die. And, you know, is it really fair to bring a next generation into the world if ultimately they're going to experience some, you know, positives of, of life? There are a lot of positives, but also a lot of negatives, including the dying process itself just to never exist again at the end of it. So to me, the finality of life can add some short-term meaning to life, but ultimately it renders life really a bit of a joke because ultimately you're here for no reason to experience pain, happiness, and then you're gone. So I could wake up and murder 10 million people or I could wake up and help 10 million people it doesn't right. matter the universe doesn't care because it's all going to end and to me that just doesn't make sense i mean from a logical and of course the universe doesn't have to make sense to exist but the thing is now that we have these experiences of near-death experiences and we have the empirical basis of them in veridical perception and experience during flat brain and things like that we now have data that if looked at openly without the preconceived dogmas i suppose of materialistic philosophy not science but philosophy then all of a sudden meaning comes back because now there's a reason for us to experience happiness and pain and that meaning is to develop and to to evolve and not evolve from a darwinian sense well i suppose in a darwinian sense but in a non-physical darwinian sense in the spiritual darwinian sense so that we evolve spiritually to become more knowledgeable more experienced because we are the universe experiencing itself in a physical form to know itself better or something like that and it's i mean my philosophy of why life exists is, is although i haven't got a clue why we exist but there's so many different theories 
none of which are correct because the universe is so complex we can only really grasp at straws we haven't got a clue um at least those of us that are alive don't have a clue and just that knowledge that or that belief that there is a meaning to some in some description there is a meaning to us being here it just makes life a little bit more bearable i suppose a little bit more worth living i agree absolutely and when you add to it the different people on the different topics around the afterlife you know the mediumship and oh so many of the other sciences and people recording audios and pictures and people in the afterlife put it all together and it equals one thing to me we go on we don't mm. know exactly our purpose here but oh we can start out with being of service loving others you know failure is a good thing mm. opportunity to learn and grow and i suppose another thing about the idea that the finality of life gives it its meaning I think if you ask any near-death experiencer who comes back with 99% of the time conviction that what they experience is real and that they are going to continue after death, you talk to those, they will tell you that they have found more meaning in life knowing that they continue, and that their life is far more enjoyable as a result of that near-death experience and that knowledge than it was before. So to me, you know, I would argue that from that point of view, it's the meaning behind life that adds meaning to life, if you know what I mean. I do. And if people can get that without having a near-death experience by listening to a show. And Darren, mm -hmm. you have no idea who's listening or watch, watching right now. And the words that you have to say could be just the thing mm -hmm. that they needed to hear. Mm -hmm. So thank you. And I know your journey hasn't been an easy one. And as human beings, it it never is mm. but there are these gems that you get to collect and then you get to share with other people and that's what you're doing and your tribe will find you it's really amazing being out there in the cyber world and youtube and itunes yes. and all that and the right people will come and you'll make a difference indeed, indeed. Let's, let's talk a little bit about the conference coming up you mm -hmm. know more details than i because you are intimately doing the audio and video and all kinds of things related to it um, but can we talk a little bit about it because i would love if our friends could either attend in person or online it's going to be a great conference. i don't know much about the layout and the content of it all i know is the people that are going to be pre-recording that's really all i know because all, all i've got from my hands is the names and the email addresses and can you please pre-record these people so i don't know much beyond that um but um, I believe it's the end of August, early September. And if it's anything like the previous conferences, which I'm sure it is, it'll be a variety of keynote speakers and panels, which I know it is because I've had a, I've um, recorded a couple panels and I suppose discussions talking about near death related phenomena, as well as some of the other phenomena that all point to um, the meaning of life, the uh, continuation of consciousness after death and the implications of this research while we're still alive um, and they've, they've done one every year the last few years has had to be virtual online because of covid the whole covid situation but now it's in person in um salt lake city yes absolutely so i was at their be... last live one in philadelphia pennsylvania a couple of years ago before covid hit and i can tell everyone it's just a wonderful conference they really take care of you i mean it's there are so many different rooms going on and different speakers you can follow what you're interested in and like i said the whole thing's being recorded and if you are at home you can enjoy it a little differently than being there in person but you can enjoy all the same things you just don't get to give hugs and shake hands with the people mm. that are with you mm. but they have so many speakers on near-death experiences and science and medicine and mediumship and different things all connected with life after death. It's really a great, a great thing. So here's some details. Now we are recording this in 2022. Uh, so the conference is August 31st through September 4th. 
You can find out more about it at IANDS.org, which is I-A-N-D-S dot org. And it's called Timeless Oneness, the Luminous Message of Near-Death Experiences and Related Spiritual Experiences. I've talked to enough people that have attended that it's life-changing. It really is. I mean, you can't be part of that for so many days and not really get that there's so much more to life than meets the eye and so much more to us than we know. So Darren, any closing words or any bits of inspiration or how do we get in touch with you? All those good things, even though I have a link in the description here. But. Um, well, the best place to get hold of me and to find all my work agglomerated into one place is, um, as you say, the website, seeking-i.com. Um, and I'm currently working on the new website where everything will all be on that site. Because at the moment, it's just a splash page that links you to various different locations. Uh, but as I'm working on the new one, which will have it all in one website. So that's where the best place to get hold of me. Um, any imparting words of wisdom? I would say for those who are experiencing anxiety and depression, first of all, the most important thing to do is to tell someone about it because I believe that the majority of suicides and, you know, things like that that come as a result of depression, especially comes because of the feeling of not, of being helpless, of having no one there to be able to help you because people believe that no one can help them. Um, you know, it's, that's part of the illusion and it's so important. And I have a friend who never told anyone about having depression. And he only told me about it because he'd seen that I was in a similar situation. And I said to him, have you told your parents? No, tell your parents. And he was suicidal at the time and he told his parents and he was able to get the help that he needed from them. Even just having someone, even just the knowledge that someone knows about it is enough to kind of keep you on, on track. And so I would say that's kind of, if you're suffering with depression, make sure somebody knows because then if nobody knows no one can begin to help you um in terms of looking at the near-death experience and other phenomena come at it with an open mind and come at it realizing that if you believe it's all impossible or it's all just an illusion then acknowledge the fact or realize the fact i suppose to begin with that everything we understand about the brain and consciousness is based on assumptions that aren't evidenced outside of correlations. So if you believe that the brain is created or that consciousness is created by the brain, first of all, that's an assumption. And I say, you know, based on nothing more than um, correlations of consciousness and, and brain activity, but there are multiple ways those correlations can be interpreted. And if you're open to the data, to look at it as data, not as a philosophical position, but as data, you will find that generally there's no reason to think that there's more to, uh, there's no reason not to think that there's more to consciousness than we currently understand. And that it's not necessarily a question of religion or philosophy, but one of science, because it is a species wide phenomena, um, a life wide phenomena it doesn't matter if you're human or dog or cat or rabbit or flea probably people have experienced them coming to them in an, in an afterlife and to me as we are simply animals of some variety there's no reason to assume that these experiences are not species wide and that there is a meaning to every piece of life that exists on the planet uh, and that we're all part of this dance called life that ultimately we won't understand why until the time's right. But, you know, it, life can be painful, very painful, but it's in those pains that we get the best lessons and the most permanent lessons of our life. You can learn a lot from having a positive experience, but pain will teach you a hell of a lot more about what's important in life and what should be strived for than any positive experience ever can. So don't take negative experiences as punishments or unfair 
um, occurrences, they can be, like losing my two dogs on the same day. It's unfair, but if you look at them as lessons, as opposed to punishments, and it's difficult, especially if you've been brought up with um, in an orthodox Christian or religious background that will tell you that you're, you were born in sin and you deserve to be punished. First of all, don't believe that. I wouldn't. I mean, you can do. I don't believe that. And I think it's, it's, it's harmful to believe that. But if you look at, at negative experiences, not as punishments, but as lessons, you can then use them to develop your own experience your own happiness your own contentment to ultimately determine what is important in life what should be strived for and what is helpful in your life i suppose darren there's a lot of gold in what you just said something you want to replay this interview make sure you replay the end i agree with you but, you know don't don't take my word for it i'm 26 you know i haven't lived full life yet so there's a hell of a lot of things i don't know but I suppose my experience with depression and being at the very bottom where everything that's unimportant was stripped away kind of gave, gave me that perspective of maybe someone who's a bit older than me, but mm -hmm. I've still got a long way to go. You do, you do. But you've learned a lot of things that many of us haven't. So, I mean, it doesn't matter your age. Every experience is valid and is important. And you were able to shed light on some things that no other guest has yet in this show. So I really appreciate you being here. Thank you. Thanks. Thank I you. Thank love, you. Love my time. Very enjoyable. Oh, very. I really appreciate it. And for our listener or our viewer, thank you. We know your time is precious and you could be doing a lot of different things, but <laughs> you were here with us for this past hour. So I really want to thank you. Our home base is we don't die.com. There's so much going on. We were talking a little bit about, oh, um, depression and also just mentioning grief. Anyone who has lost a loved one, even a furry four legged one, you can experience very, very deep grief. The more we love, the more it hurts. Chapter 10 of my book, We Don't Die, is dedicated towards grief. And I think it's the most important chapter, even though we all want to know about the afterlife. If you want a free copy of my book, that we don't die.com, just go to the store page, scroll down, you'll find my audio book. Use coupon code free, and you can either listen to it chapter by chapter, or there's a PDF copy that you can read. It's so interesting to see and learn what happens in our brain at some of those dark moments and what's autopilot, automatic, and to realize that some of these are out of your control, but yet if you realize they're happening, it's not you. It can really be very, very empowering. So that's my gift to you. We also have a lot of things going on. We offer a free Sunday gathering, which has, oh, it's an inspirational service is what it is really a great one very empowering but at the end there's a medium demonstration so people in our online community from all over the world get reconnected with their loved ones and even if you don't get one of those contacts you know that these people are still around and you too will be around long after the body dies so in closing my name is sandra champlain and always my pleasure to be your host on we don't die radio i do believe that life is an education for the soul and that our lives here on earth are important. And so from one of the amazing words of Darren is that the toughest times really can give us the most clarity of life, the most soul growth, the most the more opportunities to help someone else who may be going through it. So don't discount them. Anyways, I want to thank you for listening or for watching, and we'll see you again soon. Bye.